All right, let's do some hands here. I'm working on oatmeal paper. I'm using a fountain pen with a sepia brown ink. It's really a brown ink uh, and a fine nib, very fine, actually. It's, this is a Waterman Paris, and it's what I do in a lot of my sketchbooks. So let's get going with some hands here. Generally, whatever I'm drawing, I'm dealing with the parts as a joint-to-joint proposition and so I've got the hand here's the heel kind of the karate chop area of the hand the highlights gonna go here and so what I'm looking for is these jointed connections and we'll notice here with this hand in this position it's real easy to see that you've got uh, this series of planes and each one at the knuckle joints is going in a different direction and then the uh, wrist is taken off this way too. And so this transition here, and then it goes on in those fingers is, is of interest to us. And we wanna make sure even in a subtler pose as we'll do in our next drawing, we wanna pick up those major plane differences in some way, maybe not every single one of them, but most of them, and certainly back of the hand to wrist and uh, then back of the hand or palm area to the fingers. You want to show those those two major transitions, those two major corners. Corners give you structure. Corners give you a sense of, of the real. And so the more we can show how things break uh, in space. Okay, and I, I'm sketching, and even in a finished painting, I'll just correct. That's a bad line. And so I'll correct. I might correct that three or four times and uh, who cares? It's just a sketch. But like I said, even in my finished painting, I want to do that. Now, fact is, this we're slightly underneath this wrist. And so when I pick up the, uh, the fleshy folds where the palm, you know, all the thin eminence over here, the karate chop area there, as we make that transition down here, I want to feel that underneathness. And that means whatever detail I pick up, at the center, that detail will tend to be higher, and at the sides, it will tend to be lower. And we'll feel that. And so if I can find that information, not on the contour, but moving, so not down the form, but moving over the form, then I'm going to feel in my drawing a certain and actually a great deal of three-dimensional truth to it. And so I'm always looking for how to move the eye over the form. So when I pick up this, I'm really looking at that as a shadow shape, a simplified shadow shape of what's going on there. That shadow shape is also a corner that moves me over. So notice I can move over the form like a box or mo over the form like a ball or cylinder. And then if I take that back of the hand or palm of the hand and break it this way, that's going to tend to make us feel like we're on top of the wrist with that hand. I want to feel like we're underneath. It's going this way. And so I'm going to play up this overlap here, put the hand behind the wrist, and that's going to make a big, big impression on our audience. Now, it's all about consistency, having a kind of a game plan and being consistent. And so in my world, in this case, every time the form turns down or to the right, it gets darker. So this little area turned down and to the right, and it got darker. This went down and to the right, it gets darker. And as long as I'm consistent with that, I can, I can have quite a bit of... Uh, liberty with how I design those, what I leave in, what I leave out, as long as I consistently show that, uh, that truth there. I could even have a uh, little notation here. So when I do my big massive uh, mural on the side of Rockefeller Center, I'm going to have that hand drop off in value and um, fade away, so I'll do a little, a little cross hatching. And I particularly love pin and ink because you've got a cross hatch, which means you have to use line to suggest tone, to su suggest value. 
and that's a uh, interesting idea because since I'm a the draftsman more than the painter, I love line, and so I sneak in that idea, and I understand the painting truth through the drawn truth. That's how my mind works, and so. Um, I like to pick up those little ideas. And it's a quiet old ride if the hatching goes off into the environment. It might suggest that I'm uh, going to set that into a middle value dark environment, that kind of thing. And even how things uh, are left unfinished can be a suggestion on how I vignette out. So I'm always trying to picture make, trying to create something that's, uh, even though it's just a sketch, it's potentially a piece that will deserve a, uh, a painted reality. And the shapes, uh, the shadows are shapes. They're designs that I can exploit and make beautiful or challenging or interesting. Usually I'll have a side of the paper, I'll have a hatches where I'm testing my, my brush with oil or my uh, pen with ink to make sure that it's um, still um, making the mark I want it to make. It's not drying out or globbing up or something like that. When I do highlights, I'll just do a few here, uh, just to make up points. When I do highlights, uh, they're going to be on the corners, and then they're also going to be, so that's structural, they're also going to be gestural. How do I get off the palm and into the wrist? Here I'm going to have a little fun dance to get down over those wrinkles, Style, stylize them here. I'll maybe go over the, and it might be lost and found. It might show up, fade out, show up again as it bumps over those guys. Maybe the highlight here is hot and here it's less hot and it fades out or something like that. So let's um, take this one now. Okay, so what uh, the hand in particular creates opportunities and problems, but this is true throughout the body. It's, it's a pretty consistent set of truths on how this stuff is, is um, this information is collected and put together, and it's functional functionality. You know, the joints work in certain ways, the muscles work in certain ways, they're either contracting or they're not. You're either fighting gravity or giving in to gravity. It's passive and active, that kind of thing. And so we want to see those transitions. And so I really notice this. I want to feel how the wrist moves into the hand. And so I'm going to stylize this a little bit. And so notice this kind of contour developing. That's little corners, and it could certainly be done with curves. But every time there's a change in direction, it's suggesting a change in action. And in this case, and the audience will, will help you figure this out because they know hands better than they think they do, it's how the wrist moves into the hand. So that's a joint that, that flexes here. I don't know if that works for you, but it does that. So I want to feel that and maybe even play that up depending on my style or my uh, lesson, the life lesson I'm learning in this class right now is to draw hands and to make wrists fit in. And that wrist works as a wedge and makes this lovely transition. If it was a Renaissance painting, it would be an egg shape in here that the Madonna would have as her hands wrapping around the little belly of the baby Jesus or whatever the imagery is. 
And notice these hatches could move in exactly the same, if not contour, direction of that simplified structure, that box logic, or they can go any way they want. You know, you can make the hatches follow the form and actually track over the form as if they're laying on the surface, like it's uh, a fine fabric stitched over, or maybe not so fine fabric stitched over and laying over that wrist, like a cuff or something. Uh, or it can just be a stylized. So I'm looking for interesting shapes. <clears throat> and you can see this, uh, we w wouldn't really do it in this uh, simple s sketch probably, but you can see this little vein here in the reference. I'll highlight that. But notice how that goes from wrist to hand. And that's what I'm going to be looking for is, particularly in the hands and the feet, I want to feel, and we did a little bit of it over here, right here, I'm looking for how the hand becomes the wrist and how the wrist becomes the hand. And notice also, we have this strong shadow shape that I'm, again, changing around a little bit, as I like to do. And that lets us know that that back of the hand is not just this boxy shape but it actually rolls. And so what I like to think of is like a, a slice of a cylinder. And this would be where the fingers attach. Like so. So that there's a, this rolls over, so it's going to roll out a light. And that, that shadow will be here, here, here. It can be any place along that. I've scooted it over just a little bit. But uh, anywhere along that would be great. And so I'm going to be interested, each, each place I work, I'm going to be interested in the character of the part. You know, what kind of architectural idea is it? And of course, there's other ways to approach that problem, but that will. It's the way I tend to do it, and it's the way we'll talk about it. What's that simple architectural shape? It's not a finger. It's some something instead of a finger. It's a, an idea that I'm going to use to replace the finger. In this case, it's going to be a series of little cylinders with maybe a little spoon shape or conical shapes on the end or whatever I conceive of. And this, I'm going to simplify this out for time's sake. So I'm just looking for shapes to replace, ideas to replace the, the label. You know, when you say it's a hand, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't give any context, any emotion, any truism. It's just objectified, and it has no value to our, to our life and to the discussion about life. But if I say it's a cylinder, now at least it has an architectural truth. And that gets me started, and then I may well have some religious or psychological poetic truth you know and so that might not just be a thumb it might be the thumb that we're under you know we're under some tyrant's thumb or something so it can become a metaphor or an idea or something like that. But it starts as a problem-solving.
So almost all my marks are going down the long axis, but as I do those, I'm thinking about how it moves across the short axis. I'm drawing this and I'm thinking that. So I'm uh, kind of multitasking. And notice how, let's continue this on here. Notice the value of breaking a contour inside, going from outside to inside. When you do that, that's an opportunity. That overlap or interlock is an opportunity to give us that three-dimensional idea. We're starting to now say that this is a separate structure than this. So by having that intrude into it, uh, it's doing a lot of work for us. It gets us in front of that a little bit, and then we have the opportunity to see how it bumps against, unless it perfectly blends in, which isn't often, it bumps against that, and where we have that bump, now we have a movement over the form that gives us a lot of good stuff. So that's what we're doing here, is I'm inserting the wrist into the hand here. Let's do it this way. And by doing that, we're getting these things locking together. But anyway, it, it, by locking, breaking that down inside that, inside that, does a tremendous amount of information. One of the problems we have is, is uh, realists, whether we're stylists or not, doesn't matter. The realist problem is uh, getting that idea of three dimension on a two dimensional surface. And specifically, the problem is, is how to feel like we're moving over the form. Notice when we look at a contour or a uh, object, most of the apparent information is that contour shape is how the edge meets the environment. And notice that on a figure, most of the contours are all on the sides. There's very few ends, and when you do get an end, it goes around and not over. So when we can get anything that moves over the form in three-dimensional idea, curving or stepping over it, going like a tube or going like a box, now we have an opportunity, whether it's wrinkles or nails, dirty fingernails, by the way, uh, they'll clean that up in Photoshop, they told me. Uh, then this will, then that gives us that, that coveted three-dimensional idea. Of course, shadow does that too, but notice again, shadow's all going, most of the lines going down the form. So anytime we can break inside and especially move over, even that little bit is giving us a little bit of this th thickness truth here. So that steps over. All that's valuable information that we need. When you do the highlights, you can just blast it out. That doesn't do you a lot of good, but I'll use it as, uh, to pick up the tendinous connections. These tendons going over the metacarpals and carpals and such can give me a, a chance to get off the hand and into the wrist or off the hand and into the finger. And that's uh, getting that connectivity, how things flow together, how those, uh, it's not a form, but a complex of forms that are tightly and carefully and very specifically related together. And so each of those contour shadow shapes highlights have the opportunity to add more structure, two-dimensional and three-dimensional, but also more gesture, more fluff, showing how we move beautifully and oftentimes fluidly into the next idea and not getting broken apart like a snowball or a beaded necklace. Anytime you make a mark, 
series of marks like that, you're saying something has ended, something's begun, and you can break it to give it a little bit of style, or because it's a lost and found subtle form that's like the Loch Ness monsters emerging and submerging, or it can just be a little change. Any little mark like that, the audience gets the idea, notice that's what's happening over here too, gets the idea that there's complexity, that there's more going on than you're stating, and it makes you look smarter than you are. And you're also then suggesting that structural idea, even if you never get into the the meat and bones of describing that structure, it's suggestive of volume and mass and complexity and organic. Organic just means it's constantly changing. Notice the line never stays the same for very long. You know, I wouldn't do a radial arc that would be the same all the way around, or even a French curve, which is progressive in some way. I want it to be organic, imperfect, and a little messy in its design. Uh, that's going to suggest the fundamental evolution of life, that life is in constant change, we're in constant action, we're in constant evolution, we're getting older, our species is evolving, at least it's hope so. Now notice the, the uh, dynamic difference between the back of the hand, and I'm going to suggest a dynamic difference by a, a uh, tone. I'm just going to lay in a wash of tone or a hatch of tone in this case since I've got the medium I've got. But now all of that is suggesting a down plane. Remember this idea. And this, in my world, in this case, anytime it turns down a little bit, it gets a little darker. If it turns down a lot, like it does in here maybe, it gets a lot darker. If it turns back up, it gets lighter. Notice each of these overlaps, I'm making them go back in space. So it's this kind of logic that's going to help me feel the, uh, the go-awayness quality of that. And notice uh, what's wrong with this and this and this and this and this is that looks almost exactly like that. That's not organic. That's not sophisticated. I'm not pretending to be smart when I do that. I want each of those little marks. Look at uh, this mark, this mark, this mark, and that mark. Each of those is different. It's almost like different letters to an alphabet, and yet they still have that fluid, kind of watery design that life demands. And then that wrist comes back into view and gets lighter again. So maybe I'm going to make the fingers that turn strongly into the uh, direction of the light source the lightest. And the hand that turns down away from the light, so it's the darkest, and the um, maybe the wrist will be in a middle value. I'll do that. Darkest, middle, light. And notice over here, it's turning back this way, and so also in my world, as it goes to the left, it gets a little lighter. As it goes to the right, it gets a little darker. And... Um, that also then would uh, have a logic. So I'm trying to world build and picture make, even when it's a uh, little doodle. You know, I'm trying to get some, uh, hold on to some fairly sophisticated fundamental ideas. I'm not just observing, I'm translating. And so you're, you're always trying to do it through, not always, but we're trying to do it here through the lens of uh, of our understanding or our bias about the world. In my world, when you move over the form, we get to talk about the depth and the character of the form in a certain position in space. And when I move down the form, I'm going to talk more often about the gesture, how we flow or step from one thing to the next, however that goes. So notice this uh, fluid quality here. 
as opposed to this boxy quality here. And then when I combine them, I can get the boxy and the fluid by curves and corners. So the more curves I put it in, in the more watery, alive, and sophisticated it seems, because a curve is sophisticated, it's always changing direction. The more corners I put in, the more box logic. I get the top against the side. I get the side uh, against the front. And it can be a rounded side against a rounded front or a boxy side. It wouldn't matter the character. But that creates a certain consistency. shows how one thing separates from another. The curve shows how something groups with another. All right, that's it. To make sure you don't miss any new videos, subscribe to the Proco newsletter at proco.com slash subscribe, or click that bell icon next to the subscribe button and you'll get updates when I upload new videos. You can never have too much Proco in your life.